One second, hold on. Ayana Gabriel is joining me today. I'm very excited and hello everybody. Welcome to lunch. I'm Kaylee McCabe, contractor host. Um, we're going to be waiting for Scott in just a moment. Until then, we're joined by our guests already, Ayana Gabriel from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. And how are you doing this morning? I'm or great. I'm great. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us. And normally to kill time while we're waiting for guests, I geek out about something that I love. So you get to experience it this time. So awesome. I've been building a table and I needed to make some tapered legs, which Tapered legs can be tough to make because yeah. you're up against a fence, right? Yes. However, oh, oh my gosh, I just found a jig. This jig rides on my table saw and I can adjust it to all sorts of different pieces. And so this, oh, I tried to make jigs out of like wood before and geek out, but this has all the math done for me. Cause you know, growing up and doing construction, I didn't realize how much math is involved, but how lovely, right? Oh, that's so, pretty. That's a pretty cool tool. Yeah, thank you. So <laughs> it makes me want to build something. <laughs> Come to Colorado. We'll geek out. It's never ending story here. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, that is, it's always fun to do a jig to start off the show, yeah. but um, thank you so much for joining me today. And I do see Scott is on, but he's not quite here with video yet. So in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started because I'm very, very excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, and greetings, hello, Scott. Um, hello. Great to have you join us, hi. Um, Scott, sorry you missed hanging out with my jig and my tapered leg, but it's pretty cool. You can watch it later. <laughs> um, you're on mute. Oh, perfect. Um, well, Scott, that you know, it's perfect. It seems like you are having some technical difficulties. Are you on the road somewhere? You okay? Well, you're on mute again. <laughs> Let's see. You're perfect. I can hear you now. So I'm good now. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm on the road and my car is like taking over the controls. It's really a funky thing. So I think I've told my car to stop messing with my Zoom. I think I'm good now, but I'm not driving. That's the good thing is I am parked, um, but my car still wants to take over for some reason. This technology is crazy. It's beneficial to get to hang out with friends, but sometimes challenging. So why are you on the road then this week? Where are you headed to? Yes, yeah, so I'm headed down to Savannah, Georgia, which is about a four hour drive. You just went on mute again. Oh, that car. I'll tell you what, it's better. We're some transformers right now. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Oh, it just, Scott, you're, it keeps going back on and I'm not quite sure. I, okay, That's go weird. for it. You're, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, I am headed to Savannah, Georgia and I'm going down to speak to a group called the Southeastern Construction Owners and Associates Roundtable um, to talk about career and technical education and how we're engaging with construction companies and schools here in Georgia. So it's exactly what we're talking about today with our friend Ayana Gabriel from uh, the Blank Fund. <laughs> it's like a fun game of charades, right Ayana? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will pick off where Scott is at. Um, so Ayana Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us today. You are the senior program officer with the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. And um, I know I'm a big fan of SEFCO, you folks are too, but this year the foundation along with Home Depot um, and the Marcus Foundation announced a $5.7 million commitment to SEFCO. I love them, I wish I could do that. Why did you folks choose to support them in this way? Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, great to be here. So I think starting off, like as a foundation and for the family, education has always been a huge part of the foundation. Um, and the family very much believes in every kid having access to a high quality education. But our partnership with SEFCA actually started on the West Side with our West Side Place Space Strategy. And they're one of our lead construction partners uh, with West Side Works. Um, which was actually a, a job training program for people on the West Side. Um, a lot of the construction people end up working on the stadium. That's a fun fact that I like to tell people. 
And so, you know, over the years of working um, with SEFCA and becoming a trusted partner, it just made sense to say, okay, how can we expand this and how can we start earlier? Uh, which is something we started looking at education into helping kids have the best access to as many career pathways as, as they want and they need. It's absolutely incredible. And, you know, a, a generous gift to a great organization that is definitely going to put it forward in the right spots because this is necessary. Raising awareness takes a lot of different ways to kind of attack that. Um, and so you manage the foundation's grants. So tell me about the state of education in Atlanta, because I, I'm in Colorado. I've had the opportunity mm -hmm. to travel all over the US. I, I really think what's happening in Georgia is wonderful, but I would love to hear your opinion on it. Okay, it is wonderful. And also um, one of the things that we all try to do in philanthropy is, you know, we want to make sure that we're bringing forward like what's happening in the community. And so right now the state of education is COVID, COVID and COVID. <laughs> yes. As it is everywhere. And, you know, just a couple of things that educators and families are grappling with. Um, you know, are you gonna be in person and going back to school? Um, what are the different implications of the virtual learning and the different ways that kids learn? And service providers just really trying to help families. Um, and one thing, I know you're in Colorado, that's unfortunate about Atlanta is Atlanta has one of the highest inequality gaps um, in the country. And so we know that there are some communities, kids of color and other communities who are really, really hit hard by COVID. And so actually when I was thinking about our FB Live today, I was thinking about how important the skill trades is now even more. Um, and as a former teacher, thinking about uh, all the different ways that kids learn and experiential learner, I was an experiential learner. A lot of my students were experiential learners um, and just rethinking in this moment where education honestly is getting turned upside down because of the and just rethinking like what does education mean how do we build an education program for multiple kids and how do we build multiple pathways and so I immediately start thinking about the skilled trades I start thinking about the fact that you know if you're doing if you're at home and you can do some projects and you can build things like you were building your table legs um, all the things you can learn from that about what it may mean to be able to get on an FB Live and somebody walk you through um, a different skill sets that we know are going to pipeline into being electricians and construction workers. I just, I, I think this is a moment to say, not just for Atlanta, where, you know, honestly, everybody is rethinking education as so a foundation. Again, we've always believed that every kid and every kid in Atlanta should have access to a living wage job and should have access to economic mobility. I completely agree. And what, I mean, you are correct. It is a moment to leverage for sure. And with the advent of technology, minus it, uh, Scott's car muting him. Sometimes we talk. <laughs> we'll hear from you in a second, Scott. Um, it's a wonderful moment because we can reach so many more students and spread this message because you really nailed it on the head that, you know, we are teaching skills that perhaps you could use at home. And so now you're a better uh, homeowner, a better consumer. If you need to have professionals come in, you can ask questions that make you feel confident or you could follow through with this and get an amazing career because these just are jobs. And the yeah. stuff happening in Atlanta, you, the building industry there is off <laughs> the charts. I don't even know how many cranes you have up in the city right now, but it's intense. And that need is going to continue forever. And so, oh, it's really fun to see that uh, you folks have partnered with Sefka because, you know, Sefka, you're the CEO and president. And so with this generosity from the Arthur M. Blake Family Foundation, what is this going to do to help expand Sefka and K-12? Um, so Kayleen, can you hear me okay now? Yes, I can. Perfect. I think I have my car turned off. I think I'm good. Um, yes. But in the very short version is that the donation from these foundations, from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation and Marcus and the Home Depot Foundation, basically it's allowed us to expand our capacity to be able to reach more students than we did before, right? And so in a typical year, we might put, you know, two or 300 students to work in the construction industry. Our goal this year, because of the generosity of these foundations, is to put over a thousand students to work wow. in the construction industry. So that gives you an idea of how it's increased our capacity. It allows us to work more closely with the teachers, the construction teachers, the counselors, the parents, the students directly 
it just gives us so much more bandwidth to be able to reach so many more people across the state of Georgia. So that's really the big difference, you know, that it, that it allows for us. Well, it's amazing because we have to reach the gatekeepers, right? Uh, hey, surprise, teenagers are sarcastic. Uh, but besides <laughs> that barrier, um, Anna, what, what grade did you teach, by the way? I taught middle school and high school. Yeah. You're a saint. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, that is, it is when the sharpening of the sarcasm comes into play, but also <laughs> the awareness yeah. of the world around them. Uh -huh. So you are then definitely aware of, you know, trying to reach them. But the other gatekeepers, Scott, you're right. We're talking about the teachers, the school counselors, the parents really hitting home that this, you aren't setting your child up for failure if you're encouraging them to go into a trade. And that higher education of college or university is always there, but for the right reasons. Make that investment correctly when your career needs it. Maybe not that start off. And so, um, Scott, can you talk more about those? So SEFCA has multiple programs. There is, you know, K-12, there's uh, the pipeline, but can you talk about building careers and changing lives? Yes, yeah, so that's actually what I'm going down to Savannah to speak about is engaging with career and technical education. And, and what I'm gonna, I'll give you a preview of what I'm gonna say to the group um, in Savannah. So I think of engaging with career and tech ed a bit like baking a cake, right? You have to have all of the ingredients. You can't just break four eggs in a bowl and expect it to be a cake. And so what I mean by that is you have to do exposure. You have to make students aware of the opportunities, but you can't stop there. You have to also make sure that they get the training and the credentials that they need to be able to pursue a career in the industry. So that's another key ingredient. So you have exposure, you have training and credentialing. And then the third is you can't assume that placement is just going to happen. You can't assume that once you make a student aware of the opportunities and you get them the training and the credentials they need, that they're just going to magically start working in the industry. You have to be very intentional about saying, okay, student, you said you wanted to be a welder here's the training and the credentials for welding. And then you connect them to an employer that needs welders. And you have to do all of those steps, just like you have to include all the ingredients in a cake in order for it to be, in order for it to turn out the right way. And so that's what this investment has allowed us to do is to focus on those three key areas, to focus on exposure, to focus on making sure they get the training and the credentials that they need, but then also follow through and make sure they get that connection with a real employer. And so we do here in Georgia, in fact, Thursday this week, we're doing what we call a hiring fair, where we bring in all the students who want to work in the industry. And then we bring in employers to meet those students and actually hire them right there on the spot. And so you have to be very intentional about following through and making sure those students connect with the employers. So that's a, that's a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about down in Savannah. Kayleen, I just want to add, uh, since you were talking about teaching and just um, talk about how uh, from, you know, the good thing about the foundation is we get to do a broad set of education grants. And so we, we have a lot of partners on the West side and the service providers like Chris 180 and Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers and Georgia Tech Seismic. And part of what Scott is reminding me is that there is a pathway for helping young people figure out what they wanna do in life and then giving them the opportunity. So, you know, as a teacher, a lot of people may know from research education, like kids start thinking about what they wanna do in middle school. And so one of the things we're excited about is that SEFCA has a program that goes all the way down to kindergarten. And as Scott said, it really is about exposure. I think we probably all can remember everybody on this FB Live. You know, I used to want to be a lawyer uh, before I was an engineer because I like to talk. And, and my mom said I used to like to argue. And I did debate and I like hated it. I was like, there's no way I'm do this. And I switched all the way over to engineering. And so just the program that SEFCA has where you are exposing kids early. And then also when you get to high school, it does have to be real world. Um, and again, I can talk about that, not just from my grant making, but from being a teacher. And you do, you know, kids are savvy, especially kids today that we're talking about and youth, if you're listening, are so much more connected, can connect through so many different devices. Things are moving fast. You know, they want to know, okay, what does it really, what is it really like to be an electrician? What is it really like uh, to build a table egg? What can I really do with that? And so the fact that Sefka is giving that opportunity and then also having meaningful uh, experiences by giving kids an opportunity to have a job. It's just, it's really the right way to do it. And, and we can say yes. that, uh, you know, looking at a broad set of 
uh, programs to try to get young people into career pathways. You bring up the perfect point it is because it, okay, we have to hit it from different angles, but especially since you see this as a teacher and then someone who went into the trades, you just aren't talking about engineering. You are a chemical engineer and have worked in the industry. And so, you know, you can see the pathway mm-hmm. and I, I'm the same way. I thought I was, I was going to be president. I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> too much, <laughs> too much. Um, <laughs> because I like to talk and argue, but apparently that might be all right. But it, again, back to Safka reaching students in elementary school. I, if I had known, I would have followed a much different path and it really is important to reach that. But you know, why do you think society puts less of an emphasis still on the trades? We're looking at high levels of debt going in just to a career pathway. Mm-hmm. We're not looking at a lot of success and employment after the fact. So why do you think we, we're, the emphasis is still off? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was good intentions that had unexpected outcomes. Um, and so, you know, a couple of de- decades ago, people saw that uh, people who've gone to college you usually end up having um, more wage opportunities, but the world has changed. Um, we are in a flatter world, we are more connected, um, and the trades were always, always a good um, a career opportunity it always has been never never stopped being that but I think for a while people just didn't understand how to look at it and so you know as I told Scott and Kaylee you know not only was I a chemical engineer but I come from a family of skilled trades um, because my dad was a welder um, and most of my family uh, members uh, most of my uncles are in the skilled trades and I can tell you that uh, my dad and I geek out as you say uh, he was an ALIAC welder um, he talks about, you know, uh, the type of quality controls he does. And he was really happy when his daughter became an engineer. And uh, my brother and my mom never would understand what my dad is talking about. because We would start talking about turbine engines and the factory process. Um, and, you know, I used to work offshore and doing hitches. And when I was an engineer, people don't realize um, that half of the jobs are skilled trade jobs. Uh, as I was working, I was working with mechanics. Uh, we were working with technicians. And I can tell you that the people who had exposure to skill trades had an advantage over me. I was really good at the book side, um, even though I had some exposure because my dad, uh, you know, had a career in the trades. But it's a difference when you're an engineer and you can literally get down on the ground <laughs> with the pump technician when the pump breaks. Uh, that I actually was jealous of my colleagues who had spent a lot of time in construction careers and spent a lot of time working on their cars. And I tell my dad, I was like, man, we should have, I should have spent more time outside with you in the car. And so I think I went, you know, uh, these worlds are not disconnected. And so again, oh. if you uh, are able to go into the kind of programs that Sefka has, you will discover, you may discover that you want to stay in the electrician, or you may discover you want to go be an electrical engineer. And on both sides, you can be doing as Scott is. We'll give a shout out to your car, Scott. As we see, somebody has to um, has to program that technology. And there's a broad yeah. sense. There are people who are the programmers, and there are people who are putting it in the car. And it's not as far apart as people think. It really isn't. No, we actually call, you know, mechanics are more technicians now. They have to have a degree in computer technology to understand this stuff. I work on my cars, but they're all old because I don't do computers. I appreciate that (laughs) skill set, you know, and I'm seeing now technology like in the gaming world, the 3D virtuality stuff coming onto job sites. And that's giving the homeowners the ability to see what we're going to build. But if you had talked about bringing video games onto job sites a few years ago or blending those opportunities, I don't think anybody would see it. But I love the fact that these two groups, both Sefka and the Arthur M. Blake Family Foundation are both tuned and cued into what the opportunities are. So then with that in mind, you know, we, I believe the things and the pieces you have in place are really on the correct pathway. But how else do we lift up the trades and put it on an equal playing field of that four, four year degree. You know, I like to equate the apprenticeship to a bachelor's, but what are some other ideas with that? Yeah, I can share a little bit about um, what we're thinking about the foundation. And so again, you know, one of the things is we, we know this is just concretely, we're an Atlanta-based um, and Montana-based foundation. And so in addition to caring about the West Side and caring about other places, we care about Georgia. And so we just know that 
uh, this is a good economy and trade skills are good for Atlanta and the Georgia economy. So I think that's one of the first things <laughs> um, just from a practical standpoint. And I, I really think it's probably telling more stories um, and people actually, you know, understanding the kind of lives um, that you can have by going into skilled trades. You know, again, my my dad and my parents raised a family. <laughs> Hi, dad. Um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I can tell you that, you know, particularly because you start off um, with a skill and then you build as you can. Like I said, my dad would say he was a master welder. He had to build to that. Um, you know, it definitely is a viable career. And so um, I will also add, Kayleen, what you're saying is that there's a lot of new technology that people don't understand. Um, and that yes. is into the trades in a way that hasn't happened before. And the last thing I keep on giving a shout out to my dad, I remember when computers came to his shop um, and he was like, you know how much I have to work with computers? And he actually was working with computers before I was because he was talking about the manifest, uh, you know, the manifest mold and, you know, going in and being able to look at the process change and putting that in. And so I just think people don't understand what it looks like, to be honest. And I think we have to have more stories, more SEFCAs who are bringing in families and kids and parents to actually see what does this look like in 2020? Yeah, we're all yeah. part of demystifying the magic trick. Sorry, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, Kayleen, I just wanted to add, I agree with Ayana. We need to do a, a much better job of telling the success stories of the young people who come into our industry. And you know, we're doing that with the videos that we do with you, Kayleen, when we go out on site, which is always a lot of fun. The other thing we've learned, Ayana, though, already just in our, you know, the last year or so of working on this work is that I think we need to tone down the career language a little bit. I think sometimes students are intimidated by the idea of career. That that sounds good to us as adults. And I sure. think that's the right messaging to parents and, and counselors. But I think students are not quite ready to make, a lot of times are not quite ready to make that long-term career commitment. And so part of, I think, what we're learning is let's get them out on a job site and actually doing this work, or let's get them doing the work in a classroom or in a laboratory setting and they find out that they really enjoy it, right? And they they start doing it, they start, maybe it's just a summer job or maybe, you know, maybe it's just a job after they get out of high school, but then they find out that they really like it. And then the motivation becomes internal. They're like, hey, this yeah. is something I wanna do for the rest of my life. They might not even think of it as a career necessarily, but we've, we've learned that career is more of a kind of an adult term. It's not a term that you hear students using a whole lot. So I, that's sort of an interesting revelation for our team as we do this work. That's good. Actually, I'm so glad you said that uh, because um, as we started as a foundation looking at um, youth and looking at youth pathways, and I'm gonna I'm gonna train myself to stop saying career. We actually started doing some work with groups who are talking to kids and young people. And I, now that I remember that is coming through in the research, uh, this tells you that the adults take a while to catch up. And so I think one of the other things that is important is for all of us adults, whoever old we are, is to remember we're dealing with young people. Um, and when you're young, uh, it changes. And so what was true for a young person 10 years ago, what was true for us when we were young is different for the young people now. And so I just want to uh, add on to what you're saying, Scott, because we definitely have seen some research at the foundation that uh, the generation now that we're talking about who are in middle school and high school and young people are looking a lot more at um, a broader sense of life opportunities. Um, whereas our generation, it was just about career. And as you said, Kayleen, I think that phrase college and career, college and career is something that we as adults uh, got used to and it's different for the young people now. So I, I really, and I just want to give another plug to SEFCA. I think it's so important to have organizations like SEFCA because we can talk about this theoretically, but Scott is saying we're in front of kids every day we're talking to kids every day. We're finding out what they want and what works for them. And that's why it's important to, you know, be organizations that have that direct tie to young people. Yep. Big time. You know, it's like sneaking zucchinis into brownies if you tell kids about it. <laughs> but I agree. But, you know, I started picking up using the word career because I wanted students to understand, like, McDonald's is a job. Mm -hmm. Babysitting is a job. Working in this industry is not it's a job with potential. So is there a better phraseology to convey the, the emotion and notion that if you start off as a laborer, the career potential is gigantic. You could own the company someday. How do we say it? How, like what's the, 
hey kids come get a bunch of cash and have fun Woo! <laughs> I, it, it's a good question kayleen and we're honestly we're still figuring that out to figure out exactly what it is i don't think we have to steer cl completely clear of, of career and casting a long-term vision i think the key is just not to put too much stock in that and not to spend too much time talking about that because that's not that's not what the students want to hear necessarily. Now, the tricky thing is parents do like to hear that. And I think counselors <laughs> hear that. And so you do want to talk about it, but I don't think we want to put all of our eggs in that basket and think that talking about careers with kids is that's what's going to sell them and that's what's going to get them on board. That, that's, I think that's the key, key takeaway in all of this. Sure. And Iona, you actually said a phrase too, uh, something about life scope. Um, the students are more focused. What would you mind? Life about? opportunities. Um, and in particular, some of the research that we're looking at is that kids want to um, be uh, thriving in life, um, which is a little bit different. And when I say kids, I mean like young people who are like 16 to 24 and just talking to them. And part of his idea that uh, their parents may have had a job. Um, and that job may have been fulfilling, but it still may not have allowed them to thrive. Maybe, particularly we're talking about vulnerable kids, maybe they struggled and they were striving and they say a good life is um, one where you can do what you want. A good life is when you have a lot of options. And that is a little bit of a nuance different than a good life is to have this good job. Um, and I think the research says that kids think a job is part of it, but that's not the end goal. And I think that's part of what Scott is saying that he's hearing from young people. Um, so what, what, do, and what, what do young people want to have a good life? And that would include um, being able to do something that aligns to their passion um, and that allows them to have resources and opportunities. That's fantastic insight. And yeah, I see it too, but thank you for putting it together so succinctly because it really is refreshing, actually, that students just aren't focused on the grind and the drive. They're looking at the broader scope of the world around them. Um, but, you know, still with that, we have a lot of students to reach. And Ayana, as, as someone who works in the industry, and as a female, what would you say to get more young women into the industry? Oh, you know, honestly, what I would say, and I hope this is not controversial, is like, you're just as smart as the boys. Um, I distinctly remember uh, fifth grade math and being the only girl in my math group. Um, and I distinctly remember getting a little joy when I beat out the boys. And so we also do know from the research that um, boys and girls um, are doing these things about even in elementary school. And then it's when they get to middle school and as all middle school students of all gender <laughs> expressions um, start thinking about their identity and that unfortunately we still have a lot of images that tell girls that they, they can't weld and they can't use a chainsaw um, and they can't have a hard hat. I can't tell you again, geeking out with my dad, how proud I was. And I tell people, I was like, oh, I get up work every day and I put on a hard hat and steel toe boots because <laughs> I worked in the yeah. factory. And I always wanted to start my career in a factory. I was like, I don't want to be in the office. I want to be where the action is happening. So I would say to any girl, any young person, um, you are just as smart as your colleagues. Um, you're just as brilliant. Don't, don't shy away. And there's definitely a place for you. And then it kind of sometimes becomes fun being the only girl in the room, especially when you beat the boys out. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm competitive too. I completely understand that. <laughs> like, I remember the first time being on a job site too and looking around, I'm like, I got two hands. I can walk around. I'm taller than some of my coworkers. Doesn't, uh, I feel as strong, you know, so why not? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. oh, this, and Scout, do you have anything else to add? This half an hour flew by. It was far <laughs> too fast. I agree. I, Ayana, thank you so much for your time today and, and for all that you guys do uh, for our foundation and, and for our city. Uh, Arthur Blank is just an amazing uh, leader in our city. He does so much for Atlanta and, and Montana as well. Uh, but we're just so thankful for, for his support, for the foundation support, and for you taking time to join us today. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all the work that you do. It's amazing. Thank yes, you, Ayanna. Ayanna. Thank you.
thank you for your insight. This was delightful as a teacher and a chemical engineer. It was great insight. So thank you for taking the time. And next week, we're going to be talking with Jody Reeves from the Georgia ACTE and Leanne Wilson from the National ACTE. And for all you folks who don't follow along with all of our alphabet acronyms, that's the Association for the Career and Technical Education folks. So thank you again, both of you, for joining for lunch today. This was fantastic and so much fun. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Yes, have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah.